there's a good chance you've played or heard of the Fire Emblem games. But have you heard of the series Modern Combat Sibling? Odds are you haven't. But even if you have, let's check out what made Advance Wars stand out from the crowd. Turn-based strategy is not a lacking genre within video games. The XCOM games, the Civilization series, Fire Emblem and recent gems such as Into the Breach. They all have their own take on the genre, with some games like Civilization having tons of different choices and options the way every turn. Where military might is just as important as making sure your culture is thriving and your science is advancing. Here a game can last for hours and hours on end. Others are more focused, with no attention needed to the aforementioned culture and science, rather focusing on smaller skirmishes and fast combat, such as the classic Advance Wars series. First, I'll be focusing on the mainline Advance Wars games, here meaning Advance Wars 1, 2 and Dual Strike as they all have a continuous story as well as many of the same characters throughout the games. The Advance Wars games are probably first and foremost recognized by their cartoony and light-hearted art style, as well as its catchy music. The first game introduces you to the commanding officers of Orange Star, Nell, Andy, Max and Sammy. The story is simple but effective, with some classic elements like unlikely alliances, deceptions and plot twists. Nothing mind-blowing, but it's engaging enough. Advance Wars 2 and Dual Strike have better and more interesting stories, still nothing exceptional, but more than enough to leave you wanting more after each mission. The gameplay, however, is definitely one of Advance Wars' biggest strengths. Streamlined and focused combat with a large but not bloated selection of units, as well as plentiful of different terrain and scenarios. The combat is similar to the Fire Emblem games. It's grid-based, the different units have strengths and weaknesses to each other, you need to plan where to send your units, and even the pixel art is very similar. After all, it's the same developer. A few points that makes the two games different, however. Unlike in Fire Emblem, in Advance Wars the units have no special attacks. This makes the direct planning of charging up a unit's special attack and timing the attack correctly unnecessary. Your anti-air unit will get no benefit from attacking other enemies first before attacking the planned main target. Secondly, in Advance Wars, a unit starts out with 10 HP. And when they take damage, the firepower of the unit is reduced. Say you have an infantry unit, and one takes 4 damage in a firefight. Your unit will now be less effective, and if they were to fight an enemy which has full health now, they would do less damage as well as take more damage themselves. You are able, however, to join up two identical units to reinforce the damaged unit. A heal by unit, if you will. This is also just another layer of the simple but very good gameplay of Advance Wars. You'll always have to keep in mind the damage your units sustain and how you should utilize them after they've taken damage and have reduced effectiveness. A side note, you're also able to, in most skirmishes, to mass produce all units in factories, shipyards and airports. This, in addition to the most notable difference, no permadeath, makes the playstyles of the two game series considerably different. No permadeath makes risk-taking play much more viable, giving you the option of sending a tank in as sacrifice to get that single enemy unit that needs to be taken down, without getting the permanent punishment of losing the tank unit for the rest of the campaign. Summed up, it makes your units expendable, which makes for more aggressive and fun play. Those are some of the areas where Advance Wars stands apart from Fire Emblem. But what makes the games really unique, in my opinion, are the COs, the commanding officers. Let's have a rundown on what a CO is, what they do and why they add to the game. They are basically the playable characters. The previously mentioned special attacks for units are absent. But instead, all COs have unique special powers. Which CO you choose to play as for the match has a huge effect on how your units are most effective. 
so this will also push the player into trying different playstyles depending on the strength and weaknesses of the CEO they're using at the moment. The CEOs all have passive abilities as well as powers. An example of a passive ability. Let's take a look at Sammy. She's an infantry focused CEO who gives all your foot soldiers a 20% attack boost and 10% boost when defending against enemy attacks. She also sets all infantry units capture rate of neutral and enemy buildings to 150%. The biggest draw of choosing a CEO, however, are their powers, which are abilities that build up after dealing out or sustaining enough damage. You can then activate them, and these are the real game changers you need to plan the game around. Examples of CEO powers are Hawk's Super CEO Power, Black Storm. which heals all your units for 2 HP while giving them plus 10% to offense and defense, and then damaging all enemy units for 2 HP. It's beautiful. And then you have Eagle's power, Lightning Strike. It gives all his units a plus 10 to offense and defense as well, but also allows all units to make an additional action this turn. You can do a hit and run in one turn or an extremely aggressive push where you get to strike twice before the enemy can really retaliate. You have a significant amount of different CEOs with largely different abilities and powers. And adapting and utilizing your CEOs skill as well as being mindful of their drawbacks are vital to winning games. The CEOs have both pleasing and appealing art styles. Some can reflect their abilities. Sensei, whose infantry and helicopters are boosted, is wearing his old paratrooper outfit. Even a CEO's respective theme song fits the personality of each one. All in all, the CEOs really add to the core of the game, and it would not be the same without them. The theme songs of both the characters and factions of the Advance Wars games have always been a highlight for me. When you're spending a good 20-30 minutes on a stage, the accompanying theme better be good to listen to. And I would say that I like over 90% of all songs in the three first games. Even when I hadn't played the games for several years, I'd easily remember the name of a character and his or her theme song. Most of the songs are stupidly catchy. They also all fit the nature and characteristics of the respective CEO. Two examples. The dynamic, reckless Grim, nicknamed Lightning Grim. His official likes and dislikes are Donuts for likes and Planning for dislikes. His CEO power and superpower are named Knuckle Duster and Haymaker. This should be enough to paint a decent picture of him, and you can also see or hear how his theme fits his personality. The other example would be the big bad of the first two games, Sturm. This menace was always intimidating to fight, and you knew you were in trouble when his commanding theme started playing. Mighty and pure awesome evil. Sturm's theme is one for the books. As a side note, my all-time favorite theme would definitely be Jess's groovy and catchy theme, which is a great fit for her methodical planning and smart attitude. So, a huge draw of the Advance Wars series are definitely the characteristic CEOs, the fitting, catchy themes, and the world and story setting of the games. They made war somewhat contradictory, lighthearted, and fun. Let's talk about the game that changed that Days of Ruin. The game's setting is a stark contrast to the rather happy go lucky war of the previous games. This is the Wikipedia page, which describes Days of Ruin setting and world. Set amidst a post-apocalyptic world, the plot of Days of Ruin is considerably darker to, and unrelated to, the plots of previous games. 
almost 90% of humanity has been killed off following devastating meteor strikes, which have destroyed much of civilization and caused a massive dust cloud to blot out the sun. Gone are the characters you got to know and love through the previous last three games. The world built, as well as all the factions, no more. In a 2008 interview with Gamma Sutra, Intelligent Systems state that their reasoning for this change was because of the changing market for the series. Advance Wars had grown more popular in the West than in Japan, and they had found that Japanese people have a different view on war than American people do, which ended in them deciding a more gritty and somber setting would be better suited. So this is a much more serious and dark game, which for some people is a good fit. But for me at least, it deviated too much from the original series. It always stood apart with its cheery style and story, and critics mostly seem to agree that the dark turn was not necessarily a good one. In Game Informer's review, they pointed out that the change from charming cartoony roots to a dreary post-apocalyptic setting was not a plus for the game. The story is, as just said, more serious than dark. But it's a more interesting story all around than the previous games' rather simple, but still interesting, campaigns. It's mostly predictable, but it does a good job with some unexpected twists and turns. The characters are not as memorable as the previous games' characters, in my opinion. But that might very well be because Days of Ruin is only one game. Compared to characters who have been in up to three consecutive games, those are much more easily remembered. The gameplay is still the same true and tested recipe, however. Many would argue it's better in Days of Ruin, and it's probably the most well-balanced of the series' titles. No extremely powerful CO powers, but still effective in some situations. Some COs, however, don't have a power at all, and Intelligent Systems' reasoning behind this was to promote planning and strategy rather than having your whole battle plan based on your CO powers. I would say that while the gameplay is more balanced, it's not got the same pure over-the-top fun factor of the previous games. For multiplayer, this is fine, since there, balance is key. But in single-player modes, which are arguably the largest part of any Advance Wars game, I would rather have more crazy CO powers than balanced, more vanilla gameplay. This is still just my opinion, of course, and I know a lot of people easily prefer the fine-tuned balance of Days of Ruin. Still, give me the famous clip of the overpowered power of money any day. Days of Ruin has a very fitting soundtrack to go with the post-apocalyptic setting, with themes for soldiers, old hardened commanders, and your typical evil masterminds. There is more depth to the music, but the problem is that the DS's speakers did not do it justice at all, but it really shines with headphones. While I don't believe any of the teams are as catchy as in the previous games, there's a couple of standouts, such as Penny's Mr. Bear and Brenner's Hope Never Dies. The latter is an easy favorite, and really conveys the heroism Brenner embodies. Apart from the drastic setting and character change, the biggest drawback of Days of Ruin for me is all the missing content. You have great gameplay, an interesting story, a good if slightly forgettable soundtrack, but where are all the features from the previous installment, Dual Strike? Dual Strike was packed with content, and not bloated in any way. Every extra and feature had a fun purpose, and the options were more than plentiful. Here are some of the features Intelligent Systems left out in Days of Ruin. Unlocking maps and characters, dual screenplay, leveling up commanding officers, survival mode, the real-time mode, combat mode, and even hard mode. The reasoning behind removing the unlockables were, according to an interview with IGN, that they felt that such a mechanic was detrimental to the enjoyment of gamers who are too busy to take the time to unlock all of these things. The removal of survival and combat mode were, according to another interview with 1UP, because it did not fit the new design of the world, and hard mode was essentially replaced with the ability to get high ranking in a mission. I don't agree with all these changes made. Streamlining a game can have positive and negative impacts. But in this case, so many features were removed which really shortened the longevity and enjoyment for me. Also, I'm not really a fan of the style change. Days of Ruin was the last Advance Wars game we got. The series were never bestsellers, despite positive reviews. And since then, intelligent systems have shifted their focus over to the Fire Emblem series. Especially after the success of Fire Emblem Awakening. 
Even so, it has been 10 years since the last Advance Wars game. We are long overdue for a new installment. An amazing series such as Advance Wars definitely deserves a second chance. And if you haven't played the series before, I would absolutely recommend giving it a go. On the future of Advance Wars, in an interview with Eurogamer, producer of three Advance Wars titles, Hitoshi Yamagami, stated that he would absolutely like to make another Advance Wars game. But he's not sure how to implement Fire Emblem's popular relationship building into the series. If Fire Emblem's support system, as it's called, is even needed in Advance Wars, it's an entirely different beast to tackle. Another developer at Intelligent Systems, Masahiro Higuchi, said in the same interview with Eurogamer. I heard some of the staff here saying that they want to make one too, so if we have a chance, it's something I'd like to do. Here's hoping they get that chance. If you're like me and are looking for similar games to scratch that Advance Wars itch, I can definitely recommend Into the Breach, as well as to keep a keen eye on the upcoming game by Chucklefish, Wargroove. Into the Breach has a similar pixelated art style as the Advance Wars games. And it's definitely one of the greatest turn-based strategy games I've played in the last years. It's more than worth checking out. Wargroove has been a long time coming now, and it's set for a Q1 2018 release date. It's essentially Advance Wars in medieval times, and is being released for PC and all consoles, including the Nintendo Switch. If you enjoyed the video, please leave a thumbs up and feel free to subscribe. Thank you for watching.